Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Welch and today I'll be sharing with you this presentation on therapeutic fasting. I'll be making the case that, especially compared to many other medical interventions for chronic conditions, therapeutic fasting is a non-invasive, evolutionarily based and effective intervention that is underutilized in modern Western medicine. Now I'm not a physician, I'm someone who has for the last 10 years built my life around studying all the lifestyle choices available to me through an evolutionary lens. This usually goes on with every subject that I encounter until I can't talk myself out of abandoning the conventional guidance any longer. These choices for me have ranged from everything from ancestral diet and supplement choices to taking on a substantially barefoot lifestyle, which some people have known me for for a while, uh, to the specific strength training routines that I use, to pursuing year-round sun exposure, to questioning and reevaluating everything I was ever taught about femininity and masculinity, sexual health, relationships, and family structures. So like everything. But today, fasting is on the top of my mind as the latest item that I've added to my protocols for what I believe is its evolutionary appropriateness to maximize my own health goals. Now, I suspect there are not going to be any surprises in this presentation for most of you here today, but I just hope that reinforcing this idea will be a good refresher on this tool in the medical toolbox and as a recording to add to our resources for the community. So we have three main learning objectives for this presentation, which I will review with you before we proceed. The goal is that after this presentation, each participant will be able to first assess the validity and safety of fasting as an evolutionarily appropriate non-invasive therapeutic intervention. Second, to identify at least three mechanisms by which fasting can have beneficial physiological and metabolic effects. And third, explain the potential medical applications for therapeutic fasting and treatment of conditions such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and cancer. First, let me provide some background for my interest in understanding this particular topic. About seven years ago, I received a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. This is a condition of inflammation in the esophagus characterized by the presence of white blood cells called eosinophils. This condition is mainly associated with food allergies. To address this condition, the main uh, interventions that I was offered were, one, to take oral steroids indefinitely to combat inflammation, two, to dilate and stretch out the esophagus, uh, which had the potential to damage or tear it, or three, to try uh, an elimination diet, either eliminating foods I had testable sensitivities to, which was most of them, or to take a more extreme approach by limiting to an elemental diet as this is known to resolve the vast majority of cases of eosinophilic esophagitis. Furthermore, to determine whether dietary changes were having any effect, I would have to undergo invasive endoscopies and biopsies every six weeks or so with any tests we wanted to make, which was extremely inefficient and inconclusive in addressing the condition. But in spite of knowing that the condition is associated with food intake, what I found curious in retrospect is that Periodic fasting was never even proposed as a tool to give my body a break from uh, uh, among these other possible interventions. Now, one can't be fasting all the time, as eating is obviously a critical component of life and providing the body with nutrients. But what I feel is often overlooked is that the fact uh, that processing of food does actually stress and tax the body. So just as we recognize that exercise contributes to strength and fitness, but at the same time creates stress on the body and requires recovery time. Uh, eating also brings in essential nutrients, but at certain costs. These are costs not only in terms of the energy spent to acquire and break down food, but also potential damage and inflammation caused by the defense mechanisms or collateral effects of that food itself. I love this little crab guy, he's adorable. <laughs> um, obviously other organisms do not want their bodies broken down and used for our nutritional purposes. Uh, and this presents some challenges for us. Uh, so animals have uh, defense mechanisms such as fighting back or running away. And they certainly do not design themselves for maximum nutrient output to their predators. This guy is covered in armor. So quite the opposite. Um, plants, even more so, since they lack the ability to actively fight back or run away. They design their structures to strongly resist our breaking them down, and in fact, fight back with chemical toxins and anti-nutrients. Uh, to humans, the doses that we ingest are rarely as damaging to us as they would be to insects and other pests, but that doesn't make them friendly to our bodies. It just means that we're able to 
tolerate those negative effects to gain the benefits of the nutrients. Fasting, on the other hand, gives our bodies an actual break from this constant battle with our food and a chance to rest and repair using what we've already acquired. In the natural world, it's not typical for most organisms to have continuous unlimited access to food. It's much more common to go through periods of limited or no access to food. So I think that just like our circadian rhythms arose from predictable periods with sunshine for activity and without sunshine for rest and repair, alternating periods with uh, and without food create a sort of metabolic rhythm, each state providing its own benefits for bodily health, food access for nutrient acquisition, and food absence in which we utilize already acquired nutrients and undergo restoration from those taxing processes. It's especially worth considering that evolutionary pressures during periods of food unavailability, far from being a time when our body can afford to be at reduced function, such periods would be when evolution would have had the strongest pressure to incorporate mechanisms to ensure that we could still operate at high capacity in the pursuit of food sources. It would be a terrible failure of evolution if the signal of hunger from the body only warned us about the need for nutrients when it was physiologically too late for us to be prepared to solve that deficit. So hunger must warn us before our capacity to function diminishes. Now, although recommendations for dietary interventions are not uncommon in Western medical practice, actual fasting seems to be rarely recommended as a therapeutic intervention. As noted earlier, it was totally absent from the options provided in my case. But it's actually been much more common in many ancient medical traditions, such as Ayurvedic. As quoted here, Ayurveda, the Indian art of holistic medicine, considers fasting among, uh, as one among the depletion therapies. In Islamic medicine, absence from food, drink, and in their tradition, sexual intercourse, gives these bodily functions the opportunity to rest so that they become rejuvenated. Even in ancient Greece, fasting has been used therapeutically since at least the fifth century BCE, when it was recommended by Hippocrates. Yet in current society, it almost seems like sacrilege as if asking people to stop eating altogether would be either cruel or irresponsible. We'll actually took, take a look later at one important caveat as to why this could be the case, but first let's dig into the potential benefits of fasting and see where it may be worth finding ways to incorporate it. When fasting, there is no dietary input of glucose, so blood sugar cannot be relied on solely for energy. Fortunately, the body has an alternate system called ketosis, in which fats, including those already stored in the body, are able to be utilized for basic metabolic energy for muscles, as well as to supply the brain with fuel. This could be uh, considered the body's default energy system, since this is a system operating unless the presence of insulin tells the body's cells to act otherwise. Uh, okay. uh, speaking of insulin, it is released in proportion to rising blood sugar that occurs mainly from glucose ingestion. When insulin is activated, the pathways for utilizing stored fats that we just saw are inhibited. So as sugar drops, the body senses a macronutrient or caloric deficiency and hunger is stimulated. Repeated spikes in insulin from the continuous presence of too much blood glucose, especially in the absence of sufficient physical activity to deplete the glycogen stores, leads to insulin resistance as the cells which insulin tells to take up the extra blood sugar stop responding. In the absence of food intake, the lack of glucose input means that the glycogen in the liver and muscles can have a chance to be depleted and make room for more, allowing cells insulin sensitivity to return. And once insulin can take a break, the pathways for accessing stored energy can reopen. And as ketosis activates, the macronutrient hunger initiated by the blood sugar and insulin roller coaster can subside. A lot of people find that after several days, hunger goes away. Uh, finally, fasting initiates autophagy, the metabolic equivalent of the nocturnal portion of the circadian rhythm the time to clean up, remove and recycle old proteins, and pave the way for healthy new tissue to be laid down. Now to speak of some of the conditions which benefit specifically from fasting, first we'll start with obesity, somewhat obvious. It's clear that obesity is a condition which is associated with an energy surplus. In terms of pure energetic needs, it's been shown in at least one past medical study that a person with sufficient stores can live off of those for over a year without any significant side effects, as the famous uh, Angus Barbieri did for 382 days. 
There would certainly be reason to monitor such a person's micronutrient status, and Angus took a multivitamin uh, and some more specified micronutrients daily, along with, uh, in his case, non-caloric liquids ad libitum, or basically coffee and uh, black coffee and tea, really, and a soda water, I think. Uh, but in terms of pure energy allocation, obese patients have vast stores of extra energy. Now, the typical recommendation for pa such patients to lose weight involves caloric restriction, but there is a problem with caloric restriction relating to hunger and compliance, for which fasting provides several benefits. Fasting is definitely different from caloric restriction. Uh, the latter can still involve significant intake and processing effort rather than a full break for the body. In addition, on non-ketogenic caloric restriction, reduced levels of food input can provoke a regular insulin response that impedes the body from switching over to ketosis and using fat for its stored energy. As a result, due to reliance on fluctuating blood glucose for energy, hunger is often worse on caloric restriction than when fasting entirely. Um, by promoting ketosis, fasting can reduce obesity by allowing the body to use up its stores of excess energy with less hunger than caloric restriction. And then additionally, when it comes to compliance, besides the hunger aspect, facing the choice of what to eat or how much leaves a lot more room for failure in compliance compared to the simplicity and clarity of the direction not to eat at all for the specified time. In conjunction with controlling obesity, fasting is also recognized to assist in controlling type 2 diabetes. We noted that insulin has a chance to regulate when not under the constant load of food intake and Fasting, uh, more so than caloric restriction, helps in the switch over to ketosis to help regulate appetite. In the study cited here, they demonstrated the uh, effectiveness of therapeutic fasting to reverse the patient's insulin resistance, resulting in cessation of insulin therapy while maintaining control of their blood sugars. I have, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, in addition, these patients were also able to lose significant amounts of body weight, reduce their waist circumference, and also reduce their glycated hemoglobin level. And the authors go on to state that therapeutic fasting has the potential to fill a gap in diabetes care by providing similar intensive caloric restriction and hormonal benefits as bariatric surgery without the invasive surgery. Uh, thanks to Bob for forwarding me this paper on rheumatoid arthritis. In this uh, half strong study cited here, the authors note that fasting has been shown to ameliorate clinical manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, but the mechanisms by which this occurs are largely unknown. Suggested explanations for such improvements include reduced food intolerance, diminished gastrointestinal permeability, and decreased intake of, in intake of precursors of the inflammatory mediators, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes. Um, when it comes to cancer, Bradhurst and Longo reviewed studies on dietary restriction and fasting and their role in inducing cellular protection and chemotherapy resistance. And they found that various forms of reduced caloric intake, such as uh, caloric restriction or fasting, demonstrate a wide range of beneficial effects to help prevent malignancies and increase the efficacy of cancer therapies. Along with activating autophagy, which helps clean up damaged cells, uh, during chemotherapy, it's also been shown to have a protective effect on host cells while making cancer cells more susceptible to the chemotherapy. Raffigello, along with Longo and others, specifically noted that fasting causes a rapid switch of cells to a protective mode, but because oncogenes prevent the cellular switch to this stress resistance mode, starvation for 48 hours or longer protects normal yeast and mammalian cells and mice, but not cancer cells from chemotherapy. They termed this effect differential stress resistance, and they go on to say uh, in a recent article, 10 patients who fasted in combination with chemotherapy reported that fasting was not only feasible and safe, but actually caused a reduction in a wide range of side effects that uh, uh, accompanied by apparently normal and possibly augmented chemotherapy efficacy. So a lot of benefits. Um, by the way, we've covered uh, obesity, type two diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis and cancer, but this is by no means an exhaustive list of conditions. Fasting has been recommended to treat many other conditions, including hypertension, asthma, and many more. But overall, we have seen that compared to the invasive therapies often recommended for these conditions, fasting is extremely non-invasive. Rather than overriding the body's mechanisms, it allows the body to re-regulate itself. 
As long as electrolytes and some micronutrients are supplied, fasting has a low rate of side effects, aside from mild short-term participant discomfort. And of course, there's an added bonus that instead of spending money on all the other expensive medical interventions, it's basically free, aside from monitoring and supplements. Uh, personally, as I mentioned earlier, I, I try everything I recommend. Um, I've done as long as a five-day fast in November of 2019. Yesterday, on my way here, I broke a 72-hour fast. The only side effect I've personally been able to observe over several such fasts is that if I overcompensate in replacing my solid intake with liquid intake, rather than just drinking to thirst, that tends to lead to diarrhea. But after a couple of experiences, it's really pretty easy to figure that out and correct for it. One caveat to be clear about before we go wild with fasting, we talked about uh, hunger being associated with being on the insulin roller coaster. And we specified that this represents macronutrients or caloric hunger, where there's a deficiency of caloric energy available. Macronutrients are not the only thing the body gets hungry for, however. The body's appetite drive can come not only from needing energy, but from uh, many micronutrients as well. We noted that in the long-term study of the patient who fasted for over a year, he was given multivitamins and supplements. So I mentioned that I haven't personally seen any negative effects from fasting, but in contrast, my roommate, who tried to do some of these fasts with me, uh, did not respond nearly as well. She experienced a ton of hunger, difficult compliance, and gaining back weight quickly after fasting. But she hasn't spent the last 10 years focusing on ancestral nutrition as I have or taking supplements. And so we recently started focusing on that for her and uh, working on some supplements for her to take. So it is important to ensure that during fasting, you're either working with a patient who has strong dietary habits outside of the fast to minimize deficiencies, or some micronutrients are supplied along the way, electrolytes in particular, among some others. Um, if not, that's where we're likely to have some additional compliance difficulties and rebound effects. So this leads to my final recommendation that overall fasting represents a very useful, evolutionarily appropriate and currently underutilized tool in the Western medical toolkit. But will it help me with my eosinophilic esophagitis? Well, the unfortunate answer is that so far, there's no easy way for me to find out how much fasting I would have to do to counteract the effects of eating on a regular basis. It's not simple for me to do eliminations. As I mentioned, I measured mild sensitivities to practically every food in typical two te food tests, and there's no way I'm switching from an ancestral to an elemental diet. But at least I feel that conceptually, fasting has a place in my overall toolkit, and I hope that it can be included in future medical understandings of the condition. And I have a couple of pages of references, and that is uh, it. Thank <laughs> you.